the digestive system. Um, when we, this is a system that you've been referring to since probably fifth grade when they talk about body systems. This is always the system that everybody references. So the diagrams here are going to probably look pretty familiar. I know even in the health classes, this is the system that they um, really focus on the most. So you've probably heard a lot of the terms here, but in anatomy we take it to a whole nother level. We talk about what every layer of the digestive system does and which parts of the digestion the digestive system function in certain ways. So we have a lot of physiology in this chapter. So when we say the digestive system, we can break it down into two parts. The alimentary canal. So the alimentary canal is what you call your digestive tract. That's also called your GI tract, so gastrointestinal tract. So all of those are the same thing. All right, so alimentary canal, your uh, digestive tract, gastrointestinal tract, those are all the same thing. That begins in the mouth and ends at the anus. The main functions are to digest food and absorb the nutrients from the fruit food, and then what you don't use it should rid as wastes. Okay, so you take it in, you break it down, absorb it, and get rid of what you're not going to use. General organs for the alimentary canal include the mouth, pharynx, esophagus, stomach, small intestine, and large intestine. We're going to go into each one in quite a bit of detail. The second part of the digestive system is what we call our accessory organs. These are organs that are not necessarily in that tract, the digestive tract, but they are accessory organs necessary for digestion, the process of digestion to take place. Those include your teeth, tongue, and then it says gallbladder. Gallbladder is way spaced out from your teeth and tongue, so just kind of put that together there. All right. Digestive glands, salivary glands, liver, and pancreas. These are all what we consider accessory structures or accessory organs to digestion. Here is the diagram that has been on every state test. It continues to be on the state test when they start talking about body systems. Okay, so um, pretty general. The anatomy hasn't changed at all, and we'll go into each part in, in detail. As far as when digest or what processes are included in digestion. Ingestion, propulsion, mechanical breakdown, digestion, absorption, and defecation. What do you think ingestion is? You're just taking it in. What about propulsion? It's going from here being propelled down to your stomach and then eventually through your small intestines and so on. Mechanical breakdown. There's not enzymes on this. If it's mechanical, this is physical, like ch chewing, uh -huh, and the squeezing and all of that, that's all mechanical. Digestion is a chemical aspect. Then we have absorption. That's going to mostly take place in the small intestine. In fact, when we talk about all of the things that are going to take place today, I, I hope that I continue to point out that the majority of absorption takes place in the small intestine. So even though all of this is part of the digestive system, it's your small intestine that brings everything in. And then defecation is carried out by your large intestine. So this is you getting rid of waste. By the time it makes it to the large intestine, you're pretty much done with it. It'll sit there for 12 to 24 hours. You'll dehydrate it. You'll absorb some water from it, but no nutrients. Some bacteria may start to break it down, which will cause you to fart. But there, your body is done with that food when it makes it to the large intestine. So here kind of shows you a pictorial representation you can kind of see the in ingestion, the mechanical breakdown, so it's showing the teeth, like the grinding. Propulsion, it moving down. Digestion, that's the chemical aspect. Absorption, and then here you have the defecation, getting rid of it. Here it brings up two terms that we're going to use um, as we get really, we'll say it in the esophagus and then small and large intestines again. The terms are peristalsis and segmentation. Peristalsis is a contraction that continues to push what we're going to end up calling a bolus. A bolus is a bite of food because you don't take the whole hamburger in, you take a bite of it because that's all you can take. Your, your uvula will tell you, hey, this is a, a good sized bite and then you will swallow it. Peristalsis is the contractions that help move it down. Okay, And they're wave-like contractions. So they continue. So as you swallow it, the esophagus will contract in waves in order to help move it down. It doesn't just drop. 
from your mouth to your stomach, okay? Then there's segmentation. In segmentation, we really see this in the small intestine. It kind of pushes it this direction, and then it kind of pushes it back a little. And that allows also for mixing. So we also see that um, in the first parts of the small intestine as it kind of mixes back and forth. It gives us a little bit of additional time to work with it. So peristalsis is moving it in one direction. Segmentation is moving it kind of back and forth a little bit, and it's working its way down, but it's, it's moving back adjacently back and forth. Okay. So peristalsis is those wave-like contractions, and um, segmentation is moving it back and forth. Mechanoreceptors and chemoreceptors, I expect that you already know that mechanoreceptor responds to Mechanoreceptors are going to respond to physical distortion. Something twisting, turning, putting pressure, vibration. That's all mechano. What's chemoreceptor respond to? Chemicals. Okay, so mechanoreceptors are going to tell you, hey, you've got food in your mouth. Hey, you're chewing this. This chip is sharp. This ice, well, that would be technically a chemo chemoreceptor, but this ice is not cold because that's a thermo, but this ice ha is sharp, has sharp edges. Or this yogurt is creamy. That's all mechano. Chemoreceptors will tell you it's spicy and so on. All of this, mechano and chemoreceptors, will start to initiate the process of digestion, what we call digestion. Although there are a whole lot of parts to it, we over the umbrella for it is digestion. Okay? When we talk about controlling for digestion, we have intrinsic and extrinsic controls, short reflexes and long reflexes. We've talked about this already when we talked about the nervous system. The um, GI tract has its own nervous system. And so when it's time for you to digest food, you have a nervous system, an enteric system is what it's called, the enteric nervous system, that tells the, the um, digestive system, go ahead and start segmenting, go ahead and start absorbing, go ahead and do all this stuff that you're supposed to do. That's short because it's here. That's a short reflex. But what happens when we get scared? to everything that's happening here. It's shut down. It is shut down. That's a long reflex. When the central nervous system says, hey, get up and go do this, when you get up and start interacting or your sympathetic nervous system is activated, all that digestion shuts down. Because if you're up and moving, you're not digest digesting. So when it's talking about the short reflexes, it's talking about those that are in that area. Long reflexes are coming from the central nervous system. Those can be either um, stimulated by electricity, so neural, or by hormones. Okay, so those are the only two chemical mess or the only two uh, communication systems in our body. And this kind of gives you a flow chart that explains that. This is a review on the peritoneal cavity. So we have the visceral peritoneum, and then we have the the serous membrane starts with the visceral, and then it has the parietal, and then in between the two it has peritoneal fluid. It's some type of fluid. So remember we name it based on its location. For the lungs we have the visceral pleura, the parietal pleura, and the pleural fluid. For the abdominal pelvic cavity we have the visceral peritoneum, the abdominal peritoneum, and the peritoneal fluid. Okay. Overall, they reference that as the peritoneal cavity. Okay, and I'm going to show you kind of how we look at that. Here is showing you how that membrane goes around it. So here would be all your abdominal pelvic organs, most of them. Okay, here is showing you this term which we'll reference called mesentery. And we're going to come back to it again. But... So many times I've heard people say, like, oh my gosh, you could just see their intestines just kind of strung out. Your intestines aren't strung out, and they don't come out like a magic trick. Like if you hold one end of your intestines and pull, they don't come out. All of your organs are stuck together in place, and they're held there by a tissue called mesentery. Mesentery holds it all together. So if you were to watch an autopsy, and they were to go pull on part of the intestine, all of the organs would kind of shift together because they're all stuck together. They're held together by a tissue called mesentery. Your organs are not just free-floating 
in your abdominal pelvic cavity. I hear people say whenever a woman gives birth or has a C-section, they just took all her organs out and put them on the side. And they, no, they didn't. They couldn't do that. That's not even a thing. Yes, they did. I saw her intestines. No, you didn't. If you did, there would be an issue. That what you thought was the intestines is the umbilical cord. The umbilical cord is quite long. But when a woman is pregnant, her uterus grows in front of her organs. That's why you can see and feel the baby moving as it gets bigger. Her organs aren't just like pushed everywhere and don't just like fall out whenever she, no, they're all stuck together. They're all stuck together. In fact, we call it a block dissection. Whenever they're doing a um, autopsy, you can pull on the esophagus after you've cut some of the mesentery on the back. You can pull on the esophagus and all the organs come out together. Like you have the whole abdominal pelvic area together. They're all together. So it's this tissue, this membrane that holds it together. Okay, so your organs are not just like sloshing around. Okay, they're not. They're held in place pretty tightly. So again, the mesentery is a double layer of that peritoneum. Okay, when we say retroperitoneal versus intraperitoneal. Intraperitoneal means it's an organ that is within the peritoneal cavity. So intra within. Retro means it's behind it. If your organs are behind your peritoneum, which does happen, for sure, for example, like the kidneys are for sure, it could have been something that happened during development, and it's just unique to you. It's incorrect to assume that every organ is the same and each person in their position is the same. So retroperitoneal means it's behind that peritoneum. Intraperitoneal means it's within it. Let me show you what I'm talking about. If it's intraperitoneal, it'll be within this area. So you can see how that's there within it. This is retro, meaning that somehow or another, maybe during development, while that baby was developing embryonically, that organ just kind of pushed back behind it. It's not a big deal. If it was, then we would have an issue with it after birth and we would try to fix it. But it's not that they're going to suffer as a result of that. Okay, And that also doesn't mean that that organ's just freely floating. It's just talking about its position. <clears throat> peritonitis, what do you think that is? Yeah, it's an inflammation. Itis, anything, is an inflammation of it. In this case, it's an inflammation of the peritoneum. So peritonitis is an inflammation of the peritoneum. What could it be caused by? A lot of different things. Any type of abdominal injury. Of course, it talks about a piercing abdominal wound. Go figure. Perforating ulcer or a ruptured appendix. Those are all different scales of wounds that can cause some type, or not necessarily they all have wounds, conditions that would cause an inflammation. And the goal is, though, we want to try, in a weird way, we want to try to keep it localized so we know where to fight it. Okay, so we're grateful for that peritoneal membrane. But it does become uh, dangerous if it's continued to sit there, like and a ruptured appendix will become lethal if you don't take care of it. How do we take care of an issue? Well, we, we remove the problem and then we treat it with antibiotics if there was an infection. A lot of times, in itises or inflammations are caused by some type of bacteria, so that would be when an antibiotic runs its course. Okay, when we go through the entire alimentary canal, or the GI tract, we're going to start with mouth and we're going to end with the anus, but there are four layers as we get to the esophagus, the stomach, the small and large intestine. There's the mucosal layer, and I feel like you're okay with mucosa. That's going to be on the inside by the lumen. Submucosa is going to go outside of that. And everything in the submucosa is going to serve the mucosa. This is the same pattern as we've seen in every other system. Then outside of the submucosa, we're going to have the muscularis layer. What do you think is going to be there? Muscle. In all the other systems we've studied, we've only had one layer of muscle, but in this system we'll have two, and we'll talk about that. And on the very outside, we have the serosal layer, which is the connective tissue, which will also serve as the visceral peritoneum. Okay, and I'm going to say that again as we go through all this, because this is just the intro slide. But here... I have my lumen where everything is going through my opening, okay? It's lined with my mucosa. 
a mucosal layer. My submucosa, look what colors are here in the submucosa. Red, blue, green, and yellow. What is that telling you? It's vascular, so um, arteries and veins, oxygen poor, oxygen rich, rich, rich. I heard someone say nerves. And lymphatics. and lymphatics, yes. And lymphatics play a huge role here. Outside of the submucosa, we have two muscular layers. It says here we have a circular layer of muscle and a longitudinal layer of muscle. So you have a layer of muscle that goes this way, then you have a layer of muscle that goes this way, transverse to one another. And when you think about it, and you look at this when we go through the physiology, it'll be like this. Push, squeeze, push, squeeze, push, squeeze. They don't both go at the same time because then everything would stay in the same spot. But there's push, squeeze. So that's why those two layers of muscle are there in that way. And the very outside layer, in this case, is called the serosa. The serosa will also function as the visceral peritoneum. And when we've seen that in every system as well, the very outside layer of the organs serves as the very inside layer of the serous nervi. Okay, so keeping pretty consistent. The mucosa lines the lumen. What type of tissue do you think the mucosa is composed of? Epithelial tissue, no surprise there. Okay, and if it's the mucosa, what do you think it's secreting? Probably mucus. Yeah, probably mucus. Okay, so the very first thing it says here, secretes mucus. Digestive enzymes as well, and then hormones. It allows for some absorption, and it depends on where it's at, especially in small intestine. It protects against infectious diseases. You and I already know that because the mucosa has malt tissue, which we studied in our previous chapter, which is mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue. And that's the tissue that helps fight off any of the bacteria or pathogens or antigens that are exposed to as a result of being outside of the body. So malt tissue. We already answered this part, but when we look at the epithelium of the mucosa, it says that there's simple columnar epithelium. Simple columnar. What does that mean? One layer of column-shaped cells. Okay, we studied that previously as well. The submucosa. You and I have already kind of analyzed what colors we saw there. As far as the tissue composition, it's made of a connective tissue, an areolar connective tissue. Okay. But there are blood and lymphatic vessels. There are lymphoid follicle, fol follicles and submucosal nerve plexus. So we have red and blue, green, and then yellow, which we looked at. The muscularis layer is responsible for segmentation and for peristalsis, which are the two terms that I discussed just a few moments ago. There are a, there is a circular layer and a longitudinal layer, and in some areas, the circular layer creates a sphincter. You have an oral sphincter, so your oris is just a circular layer. You have a sphincter at the end of your esophagus, right before it gets into your stomach. You have a sphincter at the end of your stomach before it gets into your small intestine. And then you also uh, have a ileocecal, which is at the end of your small intestine before your large intestine. Then you have an anal sphincter, so where you have to tell yourself, open up so I can poop. Okay, so sphincters are just circular layers there. And we're going to talk about each of those sphincters as we go through. The very outside layer, as I've already mentioned, and put here again in writing, is the serosal membrane. Uh, or the serosal layer, I apologize, it is the visceral peritoneum. So it's the inside layer of the serous membrane. So those are one and the same. We've seen this in every system so far. The very outside of the organ is always the inside of the serous membrane. We've seen it in every, every situation so far. Okay? So same picture as just a moment ago. Any questions on the anatomy so far? Okay. So the enteric nervous system, I already mentioned that this is the local nervous system. So you have a nervous system of just your GI or uh, your gastrointestinal tract, your small intestine, large intestine, something that's guiding all of that. It mentions that within this, it's responsible for making sure that it's controlling. It's First of all, it's innervated within the GI wall, but it controls the motility. Motility. 
<clears throat> you see mobility and motility. What's the difference in those two words? Motility tells you I'm dealing with liquid. Mobility tells you I'm dealing with walking, movement, like that. So you'll see that a lot in biology, especially if you continue to study. So if something's motile, it, we would normally say it's in an aqueous type solution. Like aquatic organisms are motile, not mobile. Okay? So we're talking of, when we talk about your food, by the time it's made it this far, it's in a, a form of what we call chyme. Your chyme looks like clam chowder. And I don't show you a picture here. There's kind of an animated one, but it's just a bunch of fluid with a little bit of chunks within it. The nerve systems that you have there, you have the submucosal nerve plexus. Where do you think that is located? In the submucosa. Yeah, submucosal nerve plexus. My enteric nerve plexus. What's my no? Muscle. So these are the nerves that are controlling the muscle. Okay. So we have all these nerves within our GI tract that are controlling how we're moving our food or digesting our food. It mentions here that the sympathetic impulse will immediately do what to digestion? Stop it. It says inhibit. You should know at this point that inhibit means to stop. Parasympathetic impulses tell you that it's okay to do what? To digest. Okay? And I feel like we're, like we've said that enough in previous chapters, to keep moving. So now what we're going to do is we're going to spend a lot of time going through each part of the digestive system, beginning with the mouth. Okay, so each, each um, aspect slash organ. So the mouth, we call the oral cavity, also called the buccal or buccal cavity. It is bound by your lips, cheeks, palate, and tongue, so everybody is pretty familiar with that. The oral orifice would be that circular layer of muscle on the outside, controls what goes in and out, and it's lined with stratified squamous epithelium. Stratified tells me what? Multiple layers of squamous, which are the flat cells, very well. Okay, so here's a good picture of the mouth. <clears throat> okay, another good picture. We are going to talk about teeth here in just a moment. But it shows you that whole oral cavity. We are going to also mention the uvula, what a lot of people call the punching bag in the back. It actually has a purpose. Okay, um, we're also going to mention the lingual frenulum. And lingual frenulum is the thing that connects your tongue to the bottom of your mouth. Um, and when we get to that, I'll kind of expound upon that. So when we talk about the palate, we have a hard palate, soft palate. The hard palate is actually your maxillary bones. Remember, you have two. The hard palate is the first part of that. The soft palate is just where that maxillary bone ends. And it's just soft, and it's just skeletal muscle there behind it. So we call it hard palate because it feels hard, and soft palate because it feels soft. So it kind of works out like that. The uvula is responsible for telling you, hey, it's time to swallow. And when you do swallow, it's supposed to block food from going back up. So you swallow, and it, and it senses. It says, hey, you have a bite of food in your mouth. This is a perfect size bite, or this is a too much of a bite. So you need to throw it back up, or get rid of it, or continue to chew it, or maybe swallow it in smaller bites. But it gives you information. That's the purpose of that little punching bag there in the back of your throat. The tongue itself is skeletal muscle. It's a very strong skeletal muscle. It has two layers of muscles or two sets of muscles. Intrinsic are the muscles inside that tongue. Extrinsic are on the outside. Intrinsic will change the shape of the tongue itself. Extrinsic will change the position of the tongue. So whether you're moving it side to side in your mouth. But when you change the shape of your tongue, those are intrinsic muscles. The lingual frenulum is what attaches your tongue to the floor of your mouth. <clears throat> For some people, that's completely intact, and it changes the amount of movement their tongues can make. So if your lingual frenulum is, is completely intact, it's difficult for you to change the position of your tongue. So sometimes you have speech impediments. We, ha we do notice that in the majority of the population, people tend to rupture their frenulum naturally. But if it becomes an issue, you can just have it clipped and then your tongue is more freely movable and it can change its shape and manipulate in your mouth better. Um, a lot of times like a fall when you're really little can rupture that and you don't even know it. So um, you think about it now, you're like, oh my gosh, 
but it's really, it's really just something natural that. Why is there so much? Oh, because there is blood vessel. There are. I don't say there is. There are blood vessels there. So because it's a, a healthy tissue, um, and still there are. It's just that it doesn't come out as far. far. That frenulum is still there, connecting the tongue to the floor. So when you, if you look at that tissue in the side, we have a lot of vessels there. And if you're trying to absorb just medications, some medications can be absorbed there and make it straight into your blood because of the vessels. No. It, if you didn't move and it sat still, okay. does that make sense? Yeah. Like eventually it probably would. But the fact that the reason you clip it is so that it allows for more. <laughs> but good question. Good question for sure. This slide right here is actually taken straight out of your sensory chapter when we did special senses. We're going to talk about the tongue for just a moment. But remember you have different type of papilla on your tongue. Papilla are not your taste buds. Remember we talked about how it has to get into the little crepes, the, you know, those little crevices, and get down there to the taste buds and hit the hairs and all of that. We talked about all of that for the physiology. But um, papilla are just friction points, okay? And within the papilla, there are crevices, those crypts, that, that the uh, food and saliva can get into so that you can taste food, all right? So that... Um, you can actually send sensory information. So these are just for friction. And then as you get into them, some of them have crypts where your taste buds are actually located. These back here are tonsils. Those are not taste buds. Those are your tonsils, lingual tonsils. Um, salivary glands. So the whole purpose of a salivary gland is to secrete saliva. You secrete saliva when you think about eating. Okay. So... Um, we have the parotid, submandibular, and sublingual. Just using common sense, where do you think the sublingual is? It's probably under the tongue. What about submandibular? Under the mandible. And the parotid is actually off here, kind of to the sides. Okay. And, and then you have a lot of small salivary glands that are scattered throughout your oral cavity. But what's the function of saliva? First, clean your mouth. Second, to help you dissolve the chemicals in your food so that you can taste them. Moistens food and compacts it into a bolus. This is the first time we see the term bolus. Bolus is what we call a bite of food, ready to be moved forward. It mentions here, and this is part of the part towards the end that I'll kind of skip over, but it begins the breakdown of starch. So a question as we get through the test is going to, or get to studying for the test, is going to ask you like, where does carbohydrate digestion start? Where does protein digestion start? Carbohydrate digestion is the only thing that starts in the mouth. Nothing else begins digestion. Because remember, we have four biomolecules, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. So it's carbohydrates that begin their digestion in the mouth. Only. Nothing else. Okay, and the parotid gland, and I'm going to show you where it is physically, but the only thing you need to be familiar with with the parotid gland is that an inflammation of it is what we reference as mumps. So inflammation of the parotid gland. Submandibular, so and sublingual, this is just kind of telling you where they're located. So here's your parotid gland on both sides. Submandibular, like you said, sublingual. Okay, so those are those glands there. The questions on salivary glands. What is saliva made of? A lot of water. A lot of water. Some enzymes. It mentions here salivary amylase. Do you recall what this probably is? It's an enzyme. Lingual lipase. If it's an ACE, it's probably Enzyme. We're just talking a lot of enzymes here. It mentions electrolytes as well. Mucin, metabolic wastes. What? You might have some metabolic wastes there, like urea and uric acid. It's a unique component of your saliva. Lysozyme, immunoglobulin A, so antibodies, defensins, and a cyanide compound. So stuff to fight off to get rid of and make your mouth an uninhabitable environment for microorganisms. That's our goal. We want to taste our food and fight off any antigen.
<laughs> How much do you salivate a day? Oh, textbook number around 1,500 milliliters. That's a lot. That's a lot of saliva. That'll fill up a good sized cup. Uh, not that you want to think about that. Anyways, it talks to you about how it's activated through your parasympathetic nervous system, which we understand. It also mentions that under strong sympathetic stimulation, it inhibits all types of salivation. Strong sympathetic stimulation. What is happening if you're sympathetically stimulated? sympathetically stimulated. You're, you're doing something physically tasking. You're running, you're walking, you're working, you're doing something to where you're not resting, so you're not digesting. If it's sympathetic st stimulation, you are going to stop secreting saliva, so it's going to cause your mouth to get dry. So we see a lot of people talking about getting cotton mouth whenever they're under strong uh, sympathetic stimulation, especially out now in the summertime working. They'll come up, people will come up working from outside, and they'll be like, oh, I'm just so cotton mouth. So not only are they probably starting to get dehydrated, but because they've been working so hard, they haven't salivated any, and their mouth is really dry. Okay, now let's talk about some teeth. So um, we have two, two classifications of teeth. You have your baby teeth and your grown-up teeth. Your baby teeth we call deciduous teeth. You're going to lose them. And then your grown-up teeth we just call your permanent teeth. As a baby, you have around 20. As an adult, approximately 32. Why is such a huge difference in number? A smaller, a smaller mouth. A baby has a much smaller mouth. So if you put this many teeth inside of a baby's mouth, they would have a huge, huge mouth. <laughs> So we can, when we classify teeth, we can put them into four groups. Incisors, canines, premolars, and molars. Um, they're actually divided up by the type of diet you and I have. Um, we notice, if we study evolutionary trends, that individuals, uh, populations who over hundreds and hundreds of years only scavenged and ate like, uh, foliage plants had flatter teeth. And those that would eat more carnivorous things and hunt and had sharper teeth to tear and shred. So you and I have teeth designed for an omnivorous diet, which means we eat both meats and plants, okay? Which hence the reason that we see this. And so, when we look, and um, here's a baby, baby teeth versus adult teeth, but we have our incisors, and then we have our canine, then you have your premolars and molars. And when we look at the division, we're gonna just talk about one half of the mouth at a time, and I'll explain that. But you can see the difference in the size of um, the actual mouth itself, the areas where the teeth have an opportunity to grow. And then as these teeth come in, in a younger mouth, it's not uncommon to see them pushed and put in random places because the mouth not, might not be yet big enough to accommodate that, which is when we bring in cosmetic help like an orthodontist to help guide those teeth in as that mouth gets bigger, and then sometimes the mouth isn't big enough at all, so what do we have to do with them? We pull them. We take them out. We say, you know what, we just don't have room for these teeth. Okay? When we talk about the number of teeth, and this is all textbook, but on whenever you're looking and we're counting teeth, you're going from the midline over. So when it says upper jaw, it's just talking about on this side or this side. So upper jaw, we have two incisors, one canine, two molars for baby teeth. And then on the lower jaw, same thing, two incisors, one canine, two molars. And it says times two because whatever we have on this half of the mouth, we should also have on this half. That's why it says for our baby teeth. For the pattern for adult teeth, we have two incisors, one canine, two premolars, and three molars. And we have it both top and bottom and then same on right and left. And that's how we get 32 and 20 teeth. But again, these are textbook numbers. It is possible that people haven't had their wisdom teeth come in or those never rupture. Yeah. Some people have different, like, uh, teeth, extra teeth that grow on top of teeth. Okay, so there's a lot of different conditions, but these are textbook numbers for the number of teeth that you should have. When we're talking about teeth, we're going to go ahead and look at the anatomy of a tooth. <laughs> Only makes sense. So I'm going to show you a picture because 
I like, of course, the pictures first, and then I'll go back and make sure I've covered everything. So here shows you one whole tooth. The outside of the tooth we call the enamel. That's the crown. You can see that. It's the part of it where we see. Um, out, underneath the enamel, this blue area all the way down is called dentin. In the event that your enamel doesn't form, the dentin is what is exposed, and the dentin is not tough itself. So you'll have a lot of cavities and yellowing. It holds on to the uh, color really well. So um, whenever you have kids who are really sick and take a lot of antibiotics, young, younger and younger, and we talked about this when we talked about ear infections, you can tell because their enamel didn't form, and so they have stained teeth, like a line of stain in their teeth where that enamel didn't form completely. So that's the dentin. We have the cement. The cement is what holds that tooth in place initially. Then outside of that, we have the periodontal ligament. A ligament attaches bone to bone. So your tooth is a bone, your jaw bone is a bone. So whether it's the maxilla or the mandible. Okay, here we have the blood supply and also clearly a nerve. So here is what we call the pulp cavity and here is the root canal. When people say, talk about the root canal being so painful, it's because there's a nerve there and they can feel it, okay? Right here, what you and I call the gums is what we call the gingiva. And right here is the gingival sulcus. And that's where the tooth kind of fits into the gingiva. And in nice, healthy mouths, that gingiva should be a pinkish color. The darker it is, the more indicative of an infection, and some bacterial buildup, or you're just not brushing your teeth, which will eventually lead to infection as well. We will talk about in just a few minutes, um, after I cover all the terms, that as this area right here gets infected and you continue to let it get infected, the bacteria grows, so the gums turn red, and sometimes they start bleeding, and they're very, very sensitive. That bacteria will eventually start spreading to this ligament. And when it starts to get to that ligament, it loosens the ligament. Then tell me what happens to your teeth fall out. So, and this doesn't just happen overnight. This takes a really long time for it to occur. But you can see how the progression goes. And we can also use, and I'm not sure if I I think I said this in the cardiovascular chapter, but we can do a really good job of assessing your heart just by looking at the status of your teeth. Because if you can't take care of your teeth, you probably don't take care of yourself or your diet. And that is probably an indication that there's some, some heart issues. So we do, there is a correlation between those as well. So um, let me see if I missed anything. Oh, I already said crown. The neck of the tooth is just this part here, and here's what we call the root. Um, anytime that you have an infection, like we're going to talk about dental caries, which is, which is a cavity, it eats through that enamel. The further it eats, the closer and closer it gets to the nerve, and when it finally does get to the nerve, you have an increase in sensitivity and all of that. So it takes time for all that to happen. It takes time. It's not one of those things that just happens. So let me go back and make sure I've covered all the terms. So crown, root, cement, periodontal ligament, gingival sulcus, yes. Dentin, pulp cavity, root canal, apical foramen. Do you remember what a foramen is? A hole. A hole or opening and then it accommodates either nerves or blood vessels. So the apical foramen is this area right here, this opening that accommodates nerves or blood vessels. That's the only term I didn't mention. Questions on the anatomy of a tooth. Okay, so dental caries are the fancy word for cavities. Um, ultimately what's taken place is the enamel's been broken down, and as, a res and as a result of the enamel being compromised, bacteria find a way to shimmy their way in and start to multiply. A dental plaque. When you have plaque on your teeth, we actually call it a bacterial film. Because whenever you leave it there for a minute, and, um, and I think pretty much anybody can say, I know what you're talking about. But sometimes you run your tongue across your teeth and it kind of feels nasty. Like if you haven't brushed them in a few hours or so. It's truly because it only takes a couple hours for you to start forming a bacterial film. And the more sugar you eat, the easier that film comes together. In my biology class, we actually look at it like it's been drawn out for us. And you can see how it has this like sticky extensions to it. 
Like it's crazy how fast that film develops. And that film allows that bacteria to get stuck to your teeth. So when you lick your teeth, you don't pull the bacteria off. The only way to get the bacteria off is to brush them really, like to get it, no, I don't want to say really hard because I'm not trying to get you to ruin your teeth, but brush it to a point where you can break down that film. That is what, it, it, what you're supposed to be doing. But those bacteria, they eat off of the sugar that's on your teeth. And the, more, the longer you go without brushing your teeth, the more food they have, the more they can replicate, the more they can do, the more damage they can do. How do you prevent this? By fresh, flushing and flossing. Brushing and flossing. Why is flossing such a big deal? It's getting in between them. People say, oh, I brush really well, but when you floss, you get in between it. Gingivitis is an inflammation of the gingiva. Um, it mentions here, the plaque that you form, and when it turns into tartar, it's what we call calculus. Not like math, but that's what it's called, calculus, dental calculus. And it's, that means that that bacterial film has become so thick, it's turned into tartar. And it usually takes one of those, like a really strong pick to scrape it off, which is what they do at the dentist's office with that little hook thing. They're, they're scraping all of that off. When it forms that that thick calculus, the bacteria that can survive within that environment are what we call anaerobic. What does anaerobic mean? They don't need oxygen. So they can live within this tight quarters and this thick mass that you've allowed to accumulate on your teeth, and they can continue to replicate without oxygen, which is fantastic for them, and then not so good for you. In the event that you get an infection, if we remove it, then we're fine. But what happens is people don't take care of it, and we see the same pattern, and it's in hygiene. They don't take care of it, and eventually they end up getting the tooth pulled out. I have a friend who works for a cosmetic dentist, and she said they had an emergency surgery the other day. The guy's tooth hurt. They sat down and put him in the chair, got ready to remove his tooth, and he just is like, I'll just pull it out. Like, just pulled it straight out. What? She's like, I just smell that in chips. I was like, my facial expression could not have been held solid. <laughs> and I'm like, ooh. So it's, it's just, it, that's the thing. That's the thing. So it's not like it's somebody who's normally healthy and takes care of themselves that puts themselves in a situation like that. Okay, so periodontitis. Periodontitis is a result of the gums being neglected, so gingivitis going to the extreme. And so I had mentioned that when I was pointing out that diagram. When the gums get so infected, it begins to spread to that periodontal ligament. That ligament gets filled with that bacteria. It becomes loose and compromised itself, and then the tooth usually just falls out. It may promote atherosclerosis and clot formation in coronary and cerebral arteries. So there is a direct correlation between the health of your mouth and the health of your heart. I didn't just say like research shows, it's it specifically, your textbook covers it as well. And of course, um, risk factors, smoking, diabetes, oral piercings, not always as long as you're good with your hygiene. So down from the mouth, we go to the pharynx. The pharynx, when we talked about the respiratory chapter, I told you that this um, organ was in both systems, respiratory and digestion. So the pharynx, of course, we have the naso, oro, and laryngeal pharynx, but since we're talking about digestion, we don't need the naso pharynx because you're not taking in food from your nose. It's just going to be your oro and laryngeal pharynx. So it mentions that it allows the passage of food and fluids as well as air, so it's also acknowledging the respiratory system. It's lined with stratified squamous. We already know what that is, as well as it has mucus-producing glands. There are muscular layers that surround it in order to help move food. It doesn't really need help moving air, but moving food. The esophagus. The esophagus is a muscular tube that will carry food from the mouth. So it'll go mouth, pharynx, and then esophagus. It mentions the esophageal hiatus. The esophageal hiatus is nothing more than where the esophagus goes to the diaphragm. So the diaphragm is the muscle that allows for the compliance of the heart, or the lungs, sorry. And there's a hole in it that accommodates the aorta and the esophagus. Okay, so the esophageal hiatus. 
Where the esophagus hits the stomach, we call the cardiac orifice, and I'll show you that. And the gastroesophageal sphincter is the sphincter that allows food to go from your esophagus to your stomach. So it's a sphincter, so again, it's just a circular muscle. What is heartburn? Heartburn is nothing has nothing to do with your heart, and I'm pretty sure at this point in your life you already know that. That heartburn has to do with what you eat. And people in their heads think their stomach is way down here. But your stomach is really, really high. And so when you're, and your esophagus is not this tube that's like super long all the way down here. You know, it's kind of short. And so your stomach is up here high. Whenever you have food, that if it's some type of acidic food, hot food, whatever it is that does not agree with you, it kind of gets pushed up on that orifice, on that sphincter. And it causes pain in that area. And because that's really close to your heart, people immediately think it is heartburn. Oh, well, that's why we call it heartburn. Also, you will get heartburn if you overfill your stomach. Because that sphincter will allow for pressure to be released. So you have where your esophagus came down. Let me see, is there a diagram here? See where your esophagus comes down? Then that, there will be that sphincter. And this looks really deep but it's just right below your thoracic cage. Where the esophagus comes down, there's that sphincter, it gets into your stomach. When that stomach gets full, it kind of gets sloshed around a little bit. And this is what causes you to burp, like if you're drinking carbonation or things that cause, or some of you burp and it brings food back up. It's truly because your stomach has been overwhelmed and it's giving you an option like to get rid of it. And if you swallow it again, and it's gonna go back into your stomach, but it's going to continue to happen until there's made more room in your stomach. And that can cause that uh, acidic burning of your esophagus. It can cause heartburn. Sometimes when we see people who have eating disorders, they pr uh, brought up so much acid, it's actually eaten away at their esophagus. And they end up, we end up having to do feeding tubes. Their teeth, yes. Throwing up a whole lot will pull the enamel off of your teeth, the acidity. So... Uh, that esophagus, even though it does have four layers, and we've talked about those four layers, but you can get through them if you continue to abuse them, okay? So moving things um, down from your esophagus to your stomach. Let me make sure I covered everything. Um, why would you have heartburn? You're drinking or eating way too much. Extreme, extreme obesity, and that's usually because there's so much in there, and you're just sitting there. It's your posture as well. Why does pregnancy cause heartburn? A lot of women don't even have never had heartburn before until they're pregnant. And then they think they're dying because they've never had it before. Why does pregnancy cause it though? What is it about being pregnant? Your stomach stays the same size, but what does your uterus do? The uterus gets bigger and it starts to put pressure on the stomach. So you can right. And a lot of times when people are pregnant at first. They eat a whole lot, which is why they look fat. But as they get towards the end of their pregnancy, when they do start looking pregnant, they can't really eat that much anymore because it is so un physically uncomfortable for them. <laughs> they just, just you're, you're hungry, but you're starving, and you're the size of a house. So you're like, oh. Why do people say, like, when they have heartburn, their baby will come around with a lot of hair, and then when they don't have heartburn? I truly, that I 100% have been asked that quite a few times, but it's like a wives' tale. Um, there's, there, there's no, um, baby's head never touches anything. Like, I, I truly, I've heard so many people ask me that. They ask me a lot of questions like that. But that's one of those wives tell things. Yeah. And if you Google it, that's it says too. Because I was like, that can't be right. Because the uterus and the stomach are not yeah. connected. Yeah. So, um, a lot of women have babies with not a lot of hair and still have heartburn. It's just one of those. That's a really good question, though. That's a really good question. So, um, and then running, because people will run with food in their stomach. Like, you eat right before you run, and then it sloshes back and forth. And if you've ever done that, you know that that's a mess. Okay? Especially, like, you're going into high school, and you're starting those workouts, and you're running, and you ate breakfast right before, like, milk and cereal. You're the girl on the side of the track, or boy on the side of the track who's throwing up. Because it's just sloshing. You can a lot of times hear it, just like, Oh wait, I want to show you. Look at how cool this looks. The esophagus, it's not just this hollow tube. Like it's a muscular tube and it will expand to accommodate the food as you're swallowing it. 
you can see the four layers there that they're uh, labeled, but it's not just this perfect lumen. It's a stretchable, it's a muscle. Okay, I'm here showing you that uh, sphincter that goes between the esophagus and the stomach. Whenever we talk about the mouth, we already know that that's where ingestion occurs. We know that that mechanical digestion. Propulsion is deglutition. Deglutition is a fancy word for swallowing. Okay. Chemical digestion is where we're adding chemicals, and you can see here again it says ace and ace. So if it's ace and ace, then those are just enzymes. Okay. Salivary amylase, just so you know, is breaking down carbohydrates. Lingual lipase would function with fats, lipase, lipids. Okay. But there is no absorption that occurs in the mouth, just a few drugs, and that would be what we were just talking about referencing underneath the tongue in that thin epithelial tissue there. Chewing, the technical term for chewing is mastication. Mastication is the mechanical digestion of your food. It only is supposed to take place when your lips are closed. However, a lot of people chew with their lips open. Swallowing, however, is a result of a suction caused by your lips actually being closed. So you cannot swallow food with your mouth open. Try it. Tonight. Yeah, try it tonight and Snapchat me and let me see what you look like. <laughs> try it. Because every time I say that, everybody's like, what? Yeah. Is that just food that includes your Um, Try to swallow. Just try okay. it. Oh, jeez. Don't die. You're already creating a suction just by putting your lips around it. Like, it's, try it. Uh, Yeah, just try it. Like I said, send to me. And when you start choking, I'll send it to 911, the dispatcher. I'll be like, hey, how about my homie? I don't know where they live. <laughs> Passive, yeah. So it mentions here that the tongue is used to mix your food along with the saliva. It also puts your food into small parts called bolus. The teeth are responsible for cutting, shredding, and grinding your food. When you swallow, or when you're chewing, this is partly voluntary, but partly reflexive. So you're really just trying to break down that food as a result of it pushing up against your cheeks. You have a bunch of mechanoreceptors within your mouth that are telling you that that food needs to be broken down because you can't swallow it whole. <clears throat> so, um, deglutition, deglutition is the, the technical term for swallowing. So mastication, then deglutition. It mentions the parts of the mouth that it... it requires to work together, but 22 muscle groups in order for you to swallow. The buccal phase, or buccal phase, is the voluntary contraction of the tongue. The pharyngeal esophageal phase, and I feel like that's just a really long term for a phase, but it's involuntary, and it's controlled by the vagus nerve. This was the nerve I told you that started up here, but controlled pretty much everything below it. Um, from the medulla oblongata, but this is where you're actually swallowing. So pharyngeal, esophageal, this is where it's pushing itself down. Here is showing you, and the, the bolus is green. Okay, so the bite of food is green. So you've brought it in, you're masticating, and you start to, um, right here, this is the buccal face. You can see the mouth is closed there. They're swallowing. It's moving down through the esophagus, and you can see it continue to move down by the process of peristalsis, so it's pushing it down. It makes its way down to the stomach. And right here is that sphincter between the esophag esophagus and the stomach. So it's the gastroesophageal sphincter. Um, its name tells you where it's located. So. The gross anatomy of the stomach. The first part of the stomach where the food comes in at is called the cardia, or the cardial part. The fundus is the rounded part of the top, and the body is the main aspect of it. When someone says your stomach, they're usually referencing the body of the stomach. The very end of the stomach is called the pylorus. The pylorus, or the pyloric part, is what will eventually allow the food to go from the stomach to the small intestine. So it controls the food as it leaves the stomach. And when your food leaves your stomach, it can only leave in small amounts. It came in in small amounts, just in, in a single bite. It has to leave in a small amount. If the food leaves your stomach in large amounts, guess what that equates to for you? 
Diarrhea and throwing up, yes. Usually diarrhea because it's already made it that far. So it just slides out. There's, like, <laughs> you're welcome. Okay, so you can see it comes, here's the esophagus, it's coming in. The cardia is the first part of it. The fundus is that rounded top, and then we have the body. Look at the layers of muscle in the stomach. Look at the fibers. What can you tell me about the fibers of it? They're in all different directions. They're transverse to each other. They're not specifically in a certain plane. They're going in different directions, and this allows for the stomach to contract and manipulate your food. We also see that inside the stomach, there's all these curves. We're going to end up calling those rugae. Um, oh, it's already there. The rugae of the mucosa. This is just additional areas that will allow it to be kind of um, churned, if you will, your food to be churned. All right. As we move our way through the stomach, we have right here what we call the pyloric sphincter. The pyloric sphincter is responsible for allowing small amounts of food into the uh, small intestine a, l a little bit at a time. We're talking about like three millimeters at a time. So like if you're looking at a syringe and you have a five millimeter dose, no, we just need three. Like we just need little squirts of food so that we have time to get from it what we need. Too much is going to cause a bathroom run. This right here, it's labeled the duodenum. The duodenum, or duodenum, you can say it either way, is the very first part of the small intestine. Okay, so I said small intestine. It doesn't say small intestine. But that's part of the small intestine. We have a good-looking stomach there. Look, this shows all the tissue that's holding it together. Mesentery. Part of the peritoneum. It's an extension of the peritoneum. It's a double-layer peritoneum holding that together. So if you were to pick up that esophagus and just hold it, all those organs would stay together. It's like holding an armadillo by the tail. It would just all stay there. Okay? They're not separated. Here it kind of shows you in a colorish form and fashion. Of course, I have my stomach here. They pulled back or retracted our liver. Here are small intestines, and here will be your colon or large intestine, rectum, and then anus. Here's your little appendix if you still have it. See how what I'm talking about? This tissue is here holding it all together. So when we get into the small intestine, which we'll in just a moment, it's all together held together. It's still all loopy. And can you get it to be in a straight line? Yes, but not inside your body. Like it has to be post-mortem. After you die, we do run your bowels. We take all of the mesentery off so that we can look at each segment of it to see, if, especially if we were worried about how you die or the cause of death. Um, so we'll get there. When we talk about the autonomic nervous system in the stomach, autonomic is sympathetic and parasympathetic. Can you go ahead and tell me what's going to happen here? One's going to stop it and one is? Keep going. Which one will stop the stomach from working? Sympathetic. And which one will keep it going? Parasympathetic. Okay, and it tells you here what nerve actually controls it. But we're good with that. I just need you to know that overall what gets it going and what stops it. Wait through that. Here, it's going to show you, um, we're getting a little bit further into the stomach. We're going to talk about the actual anatomy of the stomach, the internal lining. You have what we call gastric pits, and inside of each of these pits are a bunch of crypts with a lot of cells that will release a lot of different types of secretions. We're going to look at those. So there's that up close, the gastric pit, and you can see surface cells, and then they get well into a lot of different colors. Here's what I need you to know. First of all, we have our gastric pit and we're gonna talk about the four types of cells. The surface cells, I feel like you get what a surface cell is, they're on the surface. But these ones, the, well, parietal cells, chief cells, and enteroendocrine cells are the ones that we really need to um, know the function. And I've specifically highlighted that in the notes. So in the gastric glands, we have the neck cells which are gonna lead to the surface cells. Parietal, chief, and enteroendocrine. These are the cells that you need to know what they secrete. So we have the parietal cells here in blue, and you can tell that they've got mitochondria, all their organelles, a chief cell. Enteroendocrine. Entero tells me it's in the intestines. What does endocrine tell me? Secrete some type of hormone. Yes. Okay, so the parietal cells, their secretions. Hydrochloric acid and intrinsic factor. Hydrochloric acid. Why hydrochloric acid in the stomach? Break down things. 
If I can decrease the pH enough, I will denature it. What does denature mean? I change its, its shape. I change its shape. So I break it down. Intrinsic factor is what's responsible for you absorbing vitamin B12. We've already talked previously why this is so important. There is no absorption that takes place in the stomach, but intrinsic factor allows for B12 to be absorbed when it does make it to the small intestine. Chief cells secrete pepsinogen. Pepsinogen is an inactive enzyme at that point, but it also they also secrete lipases. Lipases break down lipids. Lipids are fats. Okay? And we're not going to go into a ton of detail on lipids, but you technically can't break down lipids. Lipids are fat, so you can make them smaller, but they're still a fat. So we're going to end up calling it emulsification of fats, but I'll get there, just so you know. Like, you can break down a protein into smaller units. You can break down a carbohydrate into smaller units. But that would be a whole other lecture. Enteroendocrine. Just like you said, and they are going to secrete, intero tells us it's the intestines, but endocrine, they're going to secrete chemical messengers, specifically hormones, okay? And they're going to tell us, hey, this is what I need to occur, or hey, somatostatin tells us that we're, we're going to need to grow or we're going to not need to grow. It just These are all sending different term, or messages to different parts of our body. Okay, the mucosal barrier of our stomach. There's a, a highly acidic environment within our stomach. And this acidic environment continuously eats away at the mucous membranes of our stomach, which means that we need to constantly be regenerating the cells of our stomach. Because if we don't, then we're going to develop ulcers. If they are compromised in any way, if the development of those cells is compromised in any way, it's going to create ulcers. Damaged epithelial cells within our stomach are replaced every three to six days. And we need that to occur. So um, the... We continue to add acidity to our environment, our stomach environment, so we need to continue to take care of that tissue. Gastritis is an inflammation of that mucosal barrier. If that mucosal barrier is compromised in any way, when you eat food, if it's got bacteria on it, that's a perfect opportunity for that bacteria to, especially if it can withstand harsh conditions, perfect opportunity for it to take take um, take up residence within your stomach. That can lead to peptic or gastric ulcers. A lot of these ulcers are caused by a bacteria that gets into your stomach. The stomach acid hold, hurting, the stomach acid hurts the opening and it causes you pain. So you have what we call indigestion or you have stomach pain. So what do you do when you have stomach pain? Your stomach starts to hurt. What do you take? What type of, like Tums or like Pepto-Bismol? When you take Tums or Pepto-Bismol, it neutralizes the acidity in your stomach. So what does the bacteria have the opportunity to do? Grow more. So the bacteria will grow more. Then you'll eat again, and it'll cause more pain. You'll take more Tums and you'll continue to allow it to take up residence and spread within your stomach. Eventually, if whenever the acid and the bacteria have the opportunity to eat through your stomach wall, it will empty out into your peritoneal cavity and it becomes lethal like that. There's a coach. I coached his daughter. He was here at Waxahachie. I think it was last summer. Perfectly healthy guy. You would never know. He uh, had an ulcer. Didn't realize he had an ulcer. And it had gone all the way through and eaten through his stomach lining, was in the hospital ICU. It was crazy. They, he did pull through, and they did get him better. But you have this 32-year-old healthy man, and all of a sudden, like, because as soon as your stomach lining is ruptured and it can get through your actual stomach wall, it just empties into your peritoneal cavity. And so you have all that acid. Your body can't deal with that acid. Your body can't deal with that acid. So it mentions here, um, it's usually caused by bacteria, and sometimes it says NSAIDs. What are NSAIDs? Aspirins, Tylenols, overuse of all of that. Here's showing you what an ulcer looks up, like up close. Here's your little bacteria living within. So 
if you have bacteria in your stomach, how do you get rid of it? Antibiotics, period. If you have a bacterial issue, you get rid of it using antibiotics. Okay? Digestive processes that take place in the stomach. There's physical digestion because we're physically breaking things down, but there's also chemical digestion. Um, and we're denaturing proteins. We have enzymes, lipases, which are also enzymes. Eventually, the stomach is going to deliver chyme to the small intestine. Your food becomes chyme once it's been through the stomach and been exposed to all the different juices. Stomach juices, it could break it down. <clears throat> then, we want to, and I've already mentioned this, we want to regulate how much gets pushed in to the small intestine. So we have what we call the regulation of gastric secretion, the intestinal phase. We allow for partially digested food to enter the small intestine. And we do this just a little bit at a time. If the small intestine is pushed to accept more chyme than it can accommodate, we have dumping syndrome. Guess what dumping syndrome is? Yeah, diarrhea. Hello. I like the name of it though, right? It goes right along with what it does. Some things are obvious, a lot of things aren't. So, dumping syndrome. We often see this in people who are, did a gastric bypass surgery. Gastric bypass bypasses the stomach. So, if you do eat food, when you eat it, the stomach's not there to regulate how much is going in there. And so, eating maybe two french fries is way, is way more than three milliliters. And so it causes dumping, and so you either have people, like I know for a fact my mother-in-law had that surgery, and she ate one french fry, sat there for like two minutes, and had to go to the restroom and throw up. Did she lose a lot of weight? Yes. Was she malnourished? Yes. <laughs> she was all types of food, or just like the fatty? No, anything. Oh. All types. Yeah, so actually she ended up having to go, she, like, she got put into the hospital because she was so malnourished, and they saw that happening with a lot of their patients. So what you'll see is people go with that band, or depending on which one they have, they'll go for a little while, and then they'll have it kind of removed or enlarged to allow them to accommodate more food. But there's also liquid diets um, where you have, I don't know, I've actually drank them, protein, clear protein drinks, they're pretty good if you're not a fan of protein shakes. But that's oh, what, yeah, yeah, like a clear liquid protein. Just as much as a protein shake, but they're really good. I had a friend that had that, she wanted to look like a Yes, I, one of the girls that I work with, she w went and had that done, and she was on, on, on a clear protein diet. I never even knew what clear protein was. I was like, what does that mean? Like chicken, like blended up? <laughs> like I didn't know clear protein. So I started researching and I was like, oh my gosh, this is a thing. I want to try it. Like I just want to try what that tastes like. It tastes like, it's like fruit punch, yeah. whatever. Like you can get it at Costco. Really? Yes. You can yes, get it at H-E-B too. They're like in the bottles like this. It's called like a premier clear protein. That's what it was. Okay. Yeah, and it's like a drinking a protein shake without the like the milky chalkiness of a protein shake, and um, yeah. yeah. She drinks a lot of those, and then like uh, pee a lot. And, and that like shrinks your liver. Yeah. The whole purpose of all of that is it shrinks your liver, so it slows down your whole digestive process. So all of this. There's better ways. To go <laughs> well, so yeah. couldn't you just drink all of those things instead of having? Okay, so you actually do a pre-op surgery. Did your friend have the pre-op or pre-op diet, which is where, for like three months no, before, three months. she that's all she could drink, and that like shrunk everything in her. Then they went in it, and, but she, so you can't keep doing it without going in. And so it. that's the science. That's the psychological aspect. The part of me says you've already trained yourself, yeah, so but you're expecting to get the surgery, and you're thinking you can't do it on your own. Yeah. Yeah. So. That's a good thought. So you probably could. Yes. But yes. Did I cover it with It's a thing. So yes. Don't you spend money on it. <laughs> hey, for sure. For sure. For sure. Okay. So it also we also have to acknowledge the fact that our stomach has this crazy ability. It's made up of smooth muscle, just like the uterus. So when you put a baby in the uterus, what happens to the uterus? It expands. So when you put too much food in the stomach, guess what it does? It expands. So at first it hurts. It tells you you're full. But if you continue to practice overeating, 
that stomach will stretch and it will become bigger and bigger and then it will take more and more to make you full. So the more calories you take in, the more weight you gain. So your stomach does have the ability to accommodate your food. It is such an accommodating organ. We appreciate that. Okay? So that's what the, yeah, it's so sweet. Hospitable for sure. So while the food's in the stomach and it's now become kind, it says that there's peristaltic waves that will move it towards the pylorus. Here's me simply thinking. If you've ever been to the wave pool at like Hurricane Harbor or um, Hawaiian Falls, how the waves go one way and then they kind of come back. They go one way. That's what your food does in your stomach. So it goes this way, and then if it doesn't make it in the first spurt, it gets pushed back, and then it'll go back for some spurt. Like, that's what it does. And it continues to do that until it's all empty. And that allows it to just out a few millimeters at a time so that you can get all the processes taken care of, all the absorption in the small intestine, everything broken down, get maximize the efficiency of the absorptive process. <clears throat> so it mentions that there. It says distension and gastrin, which was one of the things that was released earlier, increase the force of the contraction. So the more that's in there, the more forceful it's going to be. The less it's in there, the less it's going to be. Distension in your stomach doesn't have anything to do with flatulent, like you passing gas. If it's in your stomach, you will usually burp it up. The gas that you pass is because of your large intestine and the bacteria in your large intestine. So you can truly say when you do that, it's not me, it's the bacteria in my stomach. Unfortunately, I've trained my kid, my youngest kid to say that, and she'll say it to me all the time. She's like, it's not me. Okay. Like, I was trying to be scientific with you, and now you've taken it to a whole other level. Wait, so can you say again how it contracts, or how it does, how it forces the contraction? So whenever, as it keeps con going back, if the stomach is distended or stretched, it's going to contract against it more. Okay. So like if it's not super full, it's not going to be a forceful contraction. But if it's really big and full, it will be forceful until it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And your stomach will continue to do that. You, that's how people shrink their stomachs. So you have enlarged the size of your stomach. It's smooth muscle, so it will get real big. You can shrink your stomach, too. It takes about 21 to 35 days. That's the time frame. But if you decrease the amount of food you put in your stomach, and that requires a whole lot of psychological discipline, physical discipline, you can actually cause your stomach to contract and get smaller so that when you do eat, it will only accommodate small amounts. And you'll notice, of course, a loss of weight. So that and there's a science behind all of that. So because there's no distension, there's nothing pressing up against it, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller so it can force that. So you can get smaller. Your stomach can get smaller. Here it says that the contractile force is most vigorous near the pylorus, which is where it's entering the small intestine. Chyme is either delivered to the duodenum, like I mentioned, in three millimeter spurts, or it's forced back into the stomach. So it goes there, it's either, or it makes it back. And it continues to go back and forth. So it kind of shows you that here. You can see that there's this big contraction to push it. It comes through. We have a small amount that makes it through. And then what doesn't make it through, that sphincter will close, and it'll get pushed back. And it'll continue. And look at what your chyme looks like. That just looks... Yes, chyme is whenever your food has made it to your stomach and all of those gastric juices from all the different cells have come together, they will break down your food into this soupiness. Like your food doesn't stay solid the whole way down. So chyme is what we call that mixture of all your food and those juices when it's broken down. Ma'am? In your stomach. Chyme is from your stomach, created in your stomach. Yes. So it actually... Go ahead, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. So it actually breaks it down, or it's just after? That's what it's, it's called after it's broken down. Chyme is what it's called after it's broken down, okay. but breaking down occurs in the stomach. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay, this is kind of on topic, but throughout this entire course, there's a lot of movement throughout the body that I learned about, but like, we don't notice any of that. Yes. Like, I don't get that. I love that. It's your body's way of maintaining homeostasis without asking you for help. Like, but just how do we not sense any of that? Because I feel like everything. Hey, so, yeah, so the thing is this, is you have a, what we call adaptation. We talked about this in the sensory system. So you're, you're being told that it's occurring, but because you don't need to worry about it, your cortex says, 
Don't perceive it. Yeah. Since that guy was saying that she knew it was a partially involuntary. And I was like, how? And then I thought about it. Sometimes when the kids are asleep, they don't. Like, you you notice a lot of things. And I love that you said that, Madison, because sometimes I think to myself, I'm like, gosh, I had no idea. No, I'll catch myself laying in bed just thinking about this kind of stuff. Like, you're going to change the world. You're going to change the world. You're going to overthink it. I love it, though. Yes, there is quite a lot of movement. Yeah. All right, regulation of gastric emptying. And I already kind of mentioned this because we're just going in three millimeter spurts, so time enters the duodenum just a little bit at a time. If it's rich in carbohydrate, it moves along really fast. But if there's a lot of fat in your chyme, it takes a lot longer to travel your digestive tract. So if you ate a high-fat dinner or a high-fat meal, it takes a lot longer to move that along. Hence, why they talk about those diets that are high in fat and not carbohydrates. Because carbohydrates, when we talked about those in a previous chapter, those are easy for us to use for energy, and we can get through them really quickly. But fats, on the other hand, take a lot of work for us to manipulate and put in a form that we can use. And so they make us feel full longer. But the buildup of fats long term is bad. So when you hear people going on those diets, you know, there's like, there's got to be something bad that could happen here. It's the type of fats that you can consume. So when you eat just straight bacon all the time and bacon grease, that's going to be a problem. Okay, but. <laughs> well, but if it's fat and it's still sitting in there, it wouldn't necessarily um, so I'm talking about the way it, your, it impacts your arteries, your okay. vessels. But like avocados, avocados are really good fats. So when you eat really good fats, plant-based fats, that's not so bad. So when they talk about low-carb diets and people are like, oh, I just eat bacon all the time. I'm only like, okay. <laughs> I'm like, I am just like that. I'm like, okay. Because like, you don't think about... Nobody thinks like you, like she's just saying, like all of a sudden you start to think about. So you can eat fats, and they're good fats. But fats will stay longer, and they take a lot longer for you to break down at, and use uh, or appropriate, delegate where they need to go. Six hours or more. So you space out when, like how much more you, or how often you eat. It's a lot, there's a huge gap there. Carbohydrate-rich food, it's through fast. I mean, not that it slides, because if it slid, you would have diarrhea, but it goes a lot quicker than um, fat-based. Vomiting, also called emesis, is caused by extreme stretching or some type of in intestinal irritant, something that upsets you. I mean, it could be that it was too hot, too acidic, too alkaline, uh, anything that you find yourself sensitive to. And what you're sensitive to, someone else not, not be sensitive to. Um, so, it just depends on that. If it's too spicy, like if you're sensitive to spicy foods. Yes. So, and it just depends on the individual. And those cha those tastes and, and those um, stimulants can change throughout life, too, depending on what, uh, what type of hormones are being released. Like when they talk about women who are pregnant craving different foods, those are usually hormonally induced. So... If different hormones are being released, perhaps you're, you're more receptive to certain foods and more sensitive to others. Excessive vomiting becomes an issue because of dehydration. We're worried about you losing all that water, all those electrolytes. And when you're dehydrated, you can't conduct electricity. You can't conduct electricity. Your central nervous system stops working. Yes? Um, maybe, maybe a really good question. Go ahead. Why whenever you experience so much pain do you vomit? Pain and vomit? I do have an answer for that. Someone has asked me that. Like my mother in law went to the hospital last night for kidney stones and before she left she was she was starting out. She was there's a reason for that too. There's a like there's an uh, I don't remember what I have read that before. Is it like I don't want to tell you the wrong answer. I, mean, I remember being asked that before and I remember reading on it. There is something associated with that. It's, it has to do with pain tolerance and your response to it. So, I don't know, there, there are some people who just cannot throw up. Like, I, for the life of me, cannot throw up. It, even if I want to throw up, like, I, I'm like, I need to throw up, I know it will make me feel better, I cannot make myself throw up. And then there's other people who are just easy to throw up. Like, the smallest thing, the smallest smell, and that's their reflex. Yes. 
there's something to it. I forget what it is, but it's their tolerance, their their pain tolerance. People who who can like eat like I there's been times like I've even put my fingers in my throat trying to make myself feel yeah, because I'm like I'm it. just like it, I I know it will make me feel better. You can. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, and saliva comes up like some of it. Not that y'all just know. Like, yes, I cannot do it. So it has, there's a tie to a tolerance factor, but I don't want to misquote what it was. But there is something to that. So, and I'm sure with extreme pain, like kidney stones, that that could cause, and I'm sure she had some medicine too. Like she was given drugs while she was at the hospital. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. When she finally agreed to go. Yeah. I'm sure she was given drugs too. So there could be an aspect of that into it as well. But I don't want to misquote what's going to happen or what it is. Okay. The gross anatomy of the small intestine. So when we talk about the small intestine, it references here that it's around two to four meters long. And that's that's a rough estimate, and that's good. In just a minute, it's going to completely contradict it because it gives different numbers in the notes. But that's a long intestine. And we have, um, when I did go to an autopsy, we took out their intestines, we ran the bowel, and we jumped rope with them. Like, they're that long, like all of your intestines. So you can do that. Um, there, there's a lot of them to that. There's three sections of your intestines. The first part is called the duodenum. Second part, jejunum, and the third part, ileum. These are all held together by mesentery. Okay? This is coming, this is the first part that talks to the, not talks to, but works with the stomach, and this is, is going to work with the large intestine or the colon. So we're talking small intestine here. So we've gone down. And um, when we talk about the first part of the small intestine, referenced as the duodenum, also the duodenum. When I was in high school, they called it the duodenum. That's what my teacher called it. Then I got to college, and they said duodenum, 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 and I was like, what are they talking about? And it just had to be the way that they were saying it. And I will say this. I think I said it in 01, but just in case, if you ever go work for a doctor and they say it differently, you say it the way the doctor wants. Don't say, my anatomy teacher said it this way. <laughs> you are a lifelong learner. <laughs> so make it work. Don't be like that. You're saying it wrong. Anyway, it's the duodenum is the shortest part of the small intestine. It mentions just around 25 centimeters. What we have coming in here, we have, an, when it says ampulla, this is a, an area that kind of does this shape. But we have something come from hepatopancreatic. What is hepato? Mm -hmm. Liver. And pancreatic is mm -hmm. pancreas. At this point, the liver and the pancreas are going to dump into the duodenum. So as soon as it makes it here. Yes, perfect. Here's the stomach right here. We had our sphincter and it let in our three millimeter spurt. Here from the liver, we have it coming in. From the pancreas, we have it coming in. When it leaves the stomach, is it acidic or basic? Acidic, super acidic. So when it gets into the small intestine immediately, we need to do what? We need to neutralize it because it will cause damage. So when these secretions are released, they're gonna help to neutralize and immediately take that pH back up so that we're not causing damage. And that happens, here's stomach right here, like this first few centimeters, okay? And then when it said the hepatopancreatic sphincter, that's what this is right here. So hepato is from the liver. This is the bile duct pancreatic duct. The jejunum is the second part, and it says here that it's around 2.5 meters long. Then it says the ileum is the last part, and it's around 3.6 meters long. When you add 2.5 and 3.6, that's clearly more than 4 meters. So that's where I'm like, mm, but these are numbers out of your textbook, so I'm going to stick with them. Anyways, I expect that you know how to do that. We'll just say the small intestine is really long. Okay, we'll just go with that. When it talks about what um, vessels control the small intestine, we have the enteric nervous system, but specifically when we come up from the central nervous system, from the medulla oblongata, we have our vagus nerve, and we've discussed that before. Um, whenever it's sympathetic act sympathetically activated, what's the small intestine doing? Nothing. When it's parasympathetically active, it's digestion is working through this thing. Okay? Structural modifications of the small intestine. So we have folds, then we have villi, and then we have microvilli. Do you recall whenever we talked about microvilli and villi, what the purpose of those were? We had cilia, and then we had villi. Absorption. And guess what happens in the small intestine? Absorption. It's the main portion of absorption. So it makes sense that we have a ton of villi here. And then on top of those villi, we have micro villi. So we have this setup. 
And let me show you. I'm going to go back to this. So we have these folds. So we have these circular folds. Okay? And then on... Let me show you right here. So I'm going to take this area right here. So here's on the fold. I have villi. And then within the villi, I have microvilli. So I am set up for a whole lot of absorption in the small intestine. I'm going to go back to make sure. Circular folds, villi, microvilli. Yes. Okay. But it also says this here. The microvilli contain carbohydrate and protein digestion. Like they have enzymes for carbohydrate and proteins. The villi have lacteals. Do you recall what lacteals were? They're lymphatics within the intestines. Guess what they bring in? Fats. You cannot absorb fats into your blood. You shouldn't. Only when you're overwhelmed with fats do you start to absorb them into your blood. They need to go through your lymphatic system first, and your lymphatic system will filter them out and help break them down and then put them into your blood safely. Okay? So when we talk about lacteals, we'll talk about bile and lacteals. That's going to be for fat absorption. Okay, so, and you can see that here within those villi, we have that lacteal, and then we have blood vessels there. Up close. More up close. Intestinal crypts. The, just like when we talked about in the stomach, we have that lining renewed every three to six days. We need to see the same thing happening inside of our intestines. Our intestines are going through a lot of activity, especially if you're eating right. It should be breaking down things, absorbing things. There should be a lot going on. So those cells are going to be kind of pushed off, and they need to be replaced. We want that to occur. If you have, or if you're taking any type of medication, antibiotics, any anti anything like that, it will impede your absorption, and those cells will be damaged. If you're going through chemotherapy, radiation, those cells will be damaged, and you'll start to have a lot of diarrhea, nausea, vomiting. So you, if you have somebody who um, is on a long-term chemotherapy or anything like that, it's not uncommon for them to have problems eating or it upset their stomach. They're constantly being nauseated because of that. Yeah, chemotherapy rapidly kills those cells because chemotherapy doesn't know the difference between good cells and bad cells. And we talked about that in 01. So it kills all cells. So we see a lot of people who are undergoing some types of therapy like that. They have to talk about being nauseated, throwing up, having diarrhea because they don't have the cells necessary to absorb the nutrients from their food. Intestinal juices, we just mentioned this a moment ago, but we needed them to be slightly alkaline because what's coming from the stomach is very acidic, and so we need it to neutralize, okay? And ultimately, the intestinal juices, and as it moves its way through the small intestine, will facilitate transport and absorption of the nutrients from that food. The liver and the gallbladder. The liver produces bile, the gallbladder stores bile. That's the functions. The liver produces bile, the gallbladder stores bile. And what is bile used for? To emulsify fat. We cannot just say we digest fat. We emulsify it. And emulsify means that we take a big fat goblet and we put it into fat droplets. That's what happens. We take a fat goblet and turn it into droplets. That's all that bile is used for. And the gallbladder stores bile for us. In the event that you have to have your gallbladder removed, your, your liver will still produce bile and just take it directly to the small intestine. So, your liver has four lobes, right, left, caudate, and quadrate. If you remove the majority of your liver, it will regenerate. Um, it mentions, I believe, 80%. You can remove 80% of your liver and it will grow back within six to 12 months. So um, your liver does, whenever you point right here and say it hurts right here, this is actually your liver that's exposed right here. And um, then your stomach is a little bit above that or slash under it and above it, behind it. So it's not your stomach that's right here, it's your liver that's more anterior to all of that. Posterior view of the liver, big old liver there. And your stomach, again, and it sits in there. It produces bile, it stores it here in the gallbladder. You can see if the gallbladder is going to send bile, it could come this way. But if there was no gallbladder, the liver would just send bile. So the gallbladder is one of those organs that we could do without if necessary. 
The cells within the liver are called hepatocytes. Hepato tells me liver, cytes tells me cells. We have a lot of blue in hepatocytes. First of all, I love their structure. They have a really cool hexagonal structure, but there's a lot of blue because as blood is coming back, it gets filtered through the liver. Okay, so we do have blood coming to the liver, so you can see some red, but a lot of it's coming back through being filtered before it makes its way back into circulation. Um, we also, you can see that there's some green there as well because the lymphatics go through the liver, and we talked about that during the lymphatic system. Hepatocytes have a whole lot of rough and smooth endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi, peroxisomes, and mitochondria. The liver is responsible for detox, detoxifying, breaking down, getting rid of things that don't shouldn't be there, removing waste. So there's a lot of activity that occurs in the liver. Your liver is a pretty stellar organ. And it tells you here that it will process any type of bloodborne nutrients, store fat-soluble vitamins, perform detoxification, produce a whole lot of bile, and then it has Kupfer cells. Kupfer cells are its in-house immune system. It's in-house immune system that helps those macrophages to get rid of things that don't belong. Yes? So the liver is an, an, is an accessory organ, right? Correct. Okay. To digestion. Yes, ma'am. And technically the liver is a gland, just so that we're on the same page. But yes, okay. they're an accessory too. The liver, yes, regenerative capacity. You can remove a whole bunch of it. And in 6 to 12 months, it can regenerate. Um, so, and it mentions here, because it's endothelial cells, endothelial means it's epithelial, which is how we classify it as the gland instead of an individual different type of organ, because it's made of glandular tissue. He hepatitis is an inflammation of that liver. Hepatitis can be caused by a lot of different reasons, most of them. Most of it is viral hepatitis. Um, then you have drug toxic toxicity, wild mushroom, what is the name? Cirrhosis is where that liver begins to uh, atrophy, it gets smaller, it becomes fibrous or fibrotic. That's usually excessive alcohol use. Um, it doesn't have to be. There are becoming to be more patients that have cirrhosis and never have consumed alcohol before. So we're, we're starting to try to figure out what else is causing this cirrhotic behavior. Um, so having a fatty liver. Um, that's also a really bad thing. Consuming way too much fat in your diet will then again cause portal hypertension. The portal vein is going through the, the liver. Hypertension is a higher blood pressure. We see people with fatty livers a lot of times they are excessive alcohol consumers. Um, so they go to the doctor to have their annual physical exam and they look that you have a fatty liver. That can actually lead, that can be just as, as lethal as having um, cirrhosis. Liver transplants are pretty successful, but we just don't have a lot of livers just laying around. And they have to be straight from a, a cadaver that's been kept alive. Actually, I don't want to say cadaver. A patient that's been kept alive, like on life support, because you have to keep that liver circulating before you transplant it. So you can't just take a liver and store it and wait for somebody to need it. Like, you're going to need to do a direct transplant. Bile. Um, I already mentioned to you that it's responsible for emulsifying fats. So while bile sits in your gallbladder, um, it, the gallbladder continues to resorb water, so it dehydrates it. Well, when you don't use the bile, that bile turns into stones, which is how you get gallstones. So it dehydrates to the point where it can't be um, passed anymore. So bile salts, their function is fat emulsification. Bilirubin, bilirubin is the pigment you get from your hemi groups in your blood. And whenever you have somebody who's jaundice, it's because of this pigment, bilirubin. This pigment is also, and I mentioned this when we did the cardiovascular chapter, this is also what causes your feces to be a brownish color. Okay, so as you're filtering it out and get rid of it. So, bile. The gall gallbladder stores and concentrate, concentrates bile by absorbing water and ions. So then when the a uh, gallbladder contracts, it releases just a little bit of bile at a time, and it goes into that small intestine, and it does its job. If the gallbladder has gallstones, if it's been so dehydrated that the bile has turned, crystallized into stones, when the gallbladder contracts, it's contracting on those stones, and that causes pain. So you hear the patient like, ah, um, and it's really, really painful for them. And in that case, 
you either go have those stones broken up with a laser, or you have the gallbladder removed. Okay, um, oh, well, here talks about gallbladders there too. So, treated with drugs, uh, ultrasound vibrations, uh, laser vaporization or surgery. Remove it. Also, I talked about that. The pancreas. The pancreas um, is responsible for, it's telling you here where it's located. But remember the pink, we talked about it initially as being an endocrine organ and releasing glucagon and insulin. But now we're talking about the pancreas as an exocrine organ. As an exocrine organ, it's going to release what we're going to call pancreatic juices. We're going to leave it at that. It's going to release pancreatic juices. These pancreatic juices are going to aid in digestion. So this is showing you the cells within the pancreas that are responsible for creating that pancreatic juice. The pancreatic juice, when you look at its composition, it's a watery alkaline solution. So again, bile is alkaline, then pancreatic juices are alkaline, and that's again to neutralize the acidity of the chyme coming into the small intestine. There's also some electrolytes, some enzymes that will also aid in digestion. Okay, and we know their enzymes when they end in ACE. But just real quick, amylase will break down carbohydrates, lipase will break down fats or lipids, and nucleases will break down nucleic acids. So we have all those ACEs there being added. Okay, so here's showing you, it's not showing you the liver and gallbladder right now, it's just showing you the pancreas and its exocrine function and showing you how, well, you don't necessarily have to know how they become activated, but showing you where it, it secretes its product. <clears throat> how do we know when to secrete bile? Whenever stuff comes into the small intestine, the duodenum, it stimulates the release of, of um, secretions from the pancreatic, hepatopancreatic duct. So that's what happens there. And when that happens, the hepatopancreatic duct will open and it will close or we'll release whatever it is into the small intestine with only just one small contraction. The next time something else comes, it will release again. So if there's something there, it's going to release. It shouldn't release if nothing is there. Chyme from the stomach contains. So when it's coming from the stomach into the small intestine, partially digested proteins and carbohydrates, undigested fats. Because what's going to take care of the fats? What emulsifies fat? Bile, yes, bile. So um, when food makes it from the stomach to the small intestines, it may stay there anywhere from three to six hours, depending on its composition. But in the small intestine, water is absorbed, and all nutrients are absorbed. There is no absorption that takes place in the mouth, esophagus, stomach, anything else. It's all in the small intestine. The small intestine does not have any role in ingestion or defecation. Small intestine is responsible for water and nutrient absorption. Whenever it's delivered to the small intestine, it needs to happen slowly, and I've already discussed why it needs to happen slowly, so that your intestines are not overwhelmed. Do you recall what segmentation is? Where it goes back and forth? And is that going to be stimulated or inhibited under sympathetic stimulation? Inhibited. And is it going to be simulated or inhibited during parasympathetic? Mm -hmm. Simulated. So here it tells you here. Parasympathetic will see an increase in activity. Sympathetic will see a decrease. You just see it over and over again. Peristalsis is when we start to move all in one direction. So we have the segmentation when there's the mixing and trying to get things to go back and forth. But as we get closer to the large intestine, we're going to start pushing to get that waste out. By the time it ends to the small intestine, it should be pretty, pretty much used up and everything taken out of it. So what may be there whenever peristalsis takes, uh, takes, begins to take place? We might have any type of remnants from our meals, some bacteria, debris that's, all of that is moved to the large intestine. So the peristalsis will move it all to the large intestine. From the duodenum to the ileum, roughly two hours, but it really depends on what you ate. So it could spend about three to six hours in the duodenum, and then another two hours to make its way down to the, the large intestine. So here's showing you peristalsis. 
getting it closer uh, to the large intestine in this case. <clears throat> the ileocecal sphincter is the sphincter that will allow whatever's in the small intestine to head on to the large intestine. So it talks about that. It also mentions that the ileocecal uh, sphincter has a valve that keeps, prevents backflow. Anytime we've seen valves, we know that it allows for one-way flow and it prevents backflow. So once it makes it to the large intestine, we don't want its way, it's making its way backwards. That's what that's saying here. When we get to the large intestine, we have the breakdown here. So we have three parts of the small intestine, and we have five parts of the large intestine. The cecum is the first part. Attached to the cecum is the appendix. Then we have the colon. Now, it says just colon here, but there are three parts to the, well, four parts to the colon. Then we have the rectum, and then we have the anal canal. So, right here, the very first part, this is the cecum. Right here is your appendix. Okay, and you can see that that's all held together by mesentery. From the cecum, we then have the colon. The colon has the ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, sigmoid colon. Then you have the rectum, and then you have the anal sphincter. So when we say the colon, there's multiple parts to it. So, and I always look at the large intestine as being like a horseshoe, because right here in the middle is all your small intestines. Um, the cecum is the first part, I mentioned that. The appendix, what's the purpose of the appendix? We believe that this is a vestigial organ. Vestigial organ means it's been left over. It used to be used a whole lot with our ancestors, but we don't necessarily need it anymore. But let me explain its purpose. It's filled with malt tissue. What is malt tissue again? Mucosal associated lymphatic or lymphoid tissue. So it's there to help fight off anything, any type of antigen. Why we think our ancestors used this, and we think this is a vestigial organ, because they used to eat raw meat, animals that were not cooked, or meat that may have sat out for three or four days, if that's how long that that mammoth or whatever was going to last them. So we believe that that was an organ that was there to help fight off disease and sickness when they ate this old meat or meat that possibly could have some type of disease in it. Okay, but we still have it, which is also why we know that if we remove it, we're going to be okay. All right, so a ruptured appendix, though, becomes an issue because it does have bacteria in it, and if that bacteria gets spread, then it's going to cause infection and could be lethal. The colon, as I mentioned, is divided into the ascending, transverse, descending, and sigmoid colon. So this is just going through the anatomy of the colon. Okay. You can see also the mesentery that's holding it all together, holding it in place with a little bit of small intestine there. Okay, a tran uh, sagittal cut on this. But my favorite part of all of this is that it shows you that it's all linked together. Like you can see where the mesentery is holding it there. And nothing is loose within that area. The rectum uh, is where feces is making its way there towards the anal opening. You have three rectal valves, three rectal valves that stop feces from being passed with gas. So the goal is that maybe you fart, but you don't poop. That's what that's saying there. The anal canal is the very last segment of the large intestine, and it opens to the exterior of your body, which we would call the anus. The sphincter, you have an internal anal sphincter, which is smooth muscle. That means you can't control it. Internal anal sphincter, you cannot control external anal sphincter is skeletal muscle you can control. So when the smooth muscle says, hey, I need you to go to the bathroom, and you say this is not a convenient time, you just squeeze this one, and we don't have to worry about that. But is there a point when this one becomes overwhelmed, the skeletal one? And the answer to that is yes. If you continue to hold it, hold it, hold it, there will be a point when the smooth muscle goes ahead and contracts, and it stimulates the relaxation of that skeletal muscle and you will use the restroom on yourself. So you do need to listen to your body. Hopefully you've learned that by this point in time. Okay, so here's an up-close picture of a rectum. Okay, and you can see here how it has that folded rigidness to it and then it, of course, will allow for those sphincters to act. Here also, something else to point out, this blue we have a lot of oxygen poor blood whenever, because right here is the toilet. Here's outside. 
these right here, when they're put under too much stress, will bulge. And this is what we call hemorrhoids. When these veins here are under so much pressure, usually because you're pushing too much or because of constipation, and that would also cause pushing too much, it causes too much pressure here and it ruptures or it causes these to bulge out. When these bulge out, if they're in within this canal, that's uncomfortable, but sometimes they bulge out to where they're sticking out here, and that's very uncomfortable for those patients. And um, there's creams and stuff that you can get to take away, like to numb that so you don't feel it. Um, even sitting down for these people is very uncomfortable, so a lot of times they sit on a donut, like a rounded pillow, so that there's not pressure put directly on there. The only way to get rid of those is to... to not have the constipation and sometimes they get so bad that they're there they're, they're that distended but um, when you eat a high fiber diet you really fight all this off so when you eat well this doesn't usually happen um, but eating a whole lot of protein can cause a problem okay and um, this is talking about the fact that as you get down through the large intestine there's no villi why is there no villi in the large intestine there's no absorption taking place. We have a thicker mucosa, okay? Um, and then it mentions that we have the venous plexus of the anal canal that if inflamed, it becomes the hemorrhoids. There's no absorption here. This is just holding it. The, let me retract real quick. If the longer your feces stays in your large intestine, the more you pull water from it. So you dehydrate your feces as they sit there. The longer your feces stay there, so the longer between your bowel movements, the more dehydrated it becomes, the more difficult it becomes to poop. So your goal is to poop at least twice a day. That's your goal. If you're pooping two or three times a day, you're solid. If you're pooping one time, at least it's regular, that's good. But if you're going like three or four days without pooping, then it's not good for you. Yes? So if you said crypts are there to hold it in, or? No, crypts are there. There will be, there's going to be bacteria there. Mm -hmm. I was just referencing villi there. I didn't want to specifically cover okay. the crypts. I was just saying there's no villi there because there's no absorption. Okay. Um, you do have a, a fauna or a flora, what we call a population of bacteria, in your large intestine. You and I do not digest plants. Anything plant-based, you and I cannot digest. When we mechanically break it down in our mouth, like chewing it, we can get the nutrients and the vitamins from it. But you and I cannot break down plants because they have a carbohydrate called cellulose that we cannot digest. So that's why when we take in plants, they usually come out looking the same way. So corn goes in looking like corn and usually it comes out looking like corn because you cannot digest corn. Now, this is where your bacteria come into play. Because as your feces are sitting in your large intestine, bacteria have the ability to break down those foods. And so when you have a really high fiber diet, so the fiber, those vegetables as they're going through your system, they actually work as like a cleaning crew. They sweep up your intestines and pull out the stuff that doesn't need to be there. And the more you eat, the more you poop. And that's a good thing. But those bacteria are starting to break down that cellulose. Now you're not getting any benefit from it. But as those bacteria grow and live in your intestine, because they do, they release methane as their, back, as their byproduct, as they're breaking down your vegetables. So what do you do? With those bacteria releasing gas, you fart. So you know whenever you're eating a whole lot of high fiber stuff, it's going gonna, it's gonna to stimulate more gas. And that's because the longer it spins in your intestine, the more the bacteria is going to break it down. So bacteria can break down that. You can't. So you can't. You can't digest fruits and vegetables. The reason you eat them is because it cleans out your intestine. And they're good for your intestines. They're good for your health. You can get the vitamins and minerals from them, but you cannot actually digest them. So they ferment indigestible carbohydrates. That's what that means. Okay, and that's a whole biology lecture there, too. They release irritating acids and gases. That's the bacteria. So again, it's not you farting. It's the bacteria. You're obviously eating healthy. <clears throat> the digestive process in the large intestine. It mentions that it could stay in the large intestine for 12 to 24 hours. There's no breakdown of food unless it's by the bacteria. But are you getting any benefit of that breakdown? No, because there's no absorption. There are vitamins that can be created there by those bacteri bacteria, water and electrolytes. 
Some of those are reclaimed because those can all soak up through water. It's an uh, osmosis will bring them through a passive diffusion. Um, it mentions that the major function of the large intestine is to propel feces to the anus and then allow for defecation. You can survive without your colon. You don't need it. So once it makes it through your small intestine, you're done with it. The colon is just kind of like a holding tank. So if your colon is damaged, we can just go from small intestine to, to rectum and be done. In fact, there's, not, there's quite a few people who have had issues with their colon, like colon cancers and stuff. We know that this is an issue. Let's remove the colon. And we do that. We just bypass it completely. So they go in and take it out. You don't need it. You do not need the colon. Postural contractions. Whenever um, you have contractions in your colon, all that's happening is it's a strong contraction that's trying to move that food closer to your rectum. It mentions here that you have what we call the gastrocolic reflex. And every day, whenever you start to eat, so like if the last meal you ate was lunch, when you go to eat dinner, as soon as you eat the first couple bites, it's going to stimulate what we call three or four mass contractions of your large intestine. So shortly after you eat dinner, you're going to need to poop. That's just, if, if you're cycling food like that, that's just the way it is. Now, when you poop after dinner, are you pooping what you just ate? No, you're pooping what had been there earlier. So at, it says here, it's initiated by the presence of food in the stomach. So once the food's made it to the stomach and it's sitting there for a little bit, then you feel this need to poop. And that's because your body's saying, we need to go ahead and get rid of all this stuff because we're about to send, send new stuff. Okay, so we call those, those hostile contractions. Those will lead to mass movements. A low fiber diet, so homeostatic imbalances. When you eat a diet low in fiber, this causes your colon to get smaller. When your colon gets smaller, though, because the contractions are stronger, we have an increased pressure on the walls of your colon, and we have what we call diverticula, which will eventually lead to diverticulosis, and a lot of people have heard of that. Ultimately, what's happening is the mucosal layer of that large intestine is becoming herniated, so it's sticking out. It's, it's not rupturing, but it's bulging. That's uncomfortable. Diverticulosis we see in a lot of elderly patients. Why do we start to see this as individuals age? What happens to their diet with age? It goes downhill. They're like, you know what? I'm just going to eat ramen noodles, ramen noodles all day or twice a day. Um, or they're in a position where they're like um, eating home-delivered meals. And it's just a very limited diet, low in fiber. Low in fiber leads to diverticulosis. And this is uncomfortable for them. Um, so, uh, or diverticulosis, diverticulitis is just, it becomes inflamed. And that could be a result of this, or it could be because you're younger and you just have a horrible diet. In the event that this inflammation begins to leak into your peritoneal cavity, that could be life-threatening to you. So, you want to make sure you're eating a nice, solid, healthy diet. And even when you become older, the expectation is that you're still going to take your multivitamin, you're still going to drink your water, do your physical activity, take a shower, you're going to eat right. Yes? Do we have Because mm -hmm. my, my mom has diverticulitis. But she doesn't even really, like, her whole life, she's had, like, a pretty good diet, but her brother also had it. His actually ruptured. But Another thing that can cause it is stress. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of... Um, it could be, it, I don't want to say it can't be hereditary, because I don't, I don't think it can, but I don't want to tell you it can't. Mm -hmm. But um, irritable bowel syndrome and diverticulitis, or diverticulitis-ish, whichever one you want to call it. And sometimes people miss, and they can be stress-induced. So I don't want to say, no, it can't be hereditary, mm -hmm. hereditary because I should probably look that up. <laughs> but I don't think it can, but it, it may. Yeah, it may. IBS or irritable bowel syndrome is where when you have to go, you need to go. When you receive the stimulation from your nervous system and those barrel receptors that say, hey, it's time to go, you have to go right then. This is very uncomfortable for the people who suffer from it because it, they, they're nauseated, their stomach hurts, and it's very embarrassing for them as well because whenever they need to go, there's not waiting five or ten minutes to stop. It happens right then. Um, it mentions that we see this happening a lot in people who are chronically stressed. 
Um, and it's, it has to do with the absorption of their food. They're not absorbing what they need to. Their B12 levels are down. They tend to have to go to the bathroom a lot more often. And it's not like a, a regular bowel movement. It's a more of like a diarrhea base. And it, sometimes it's food induced too. Like sometimes people will drink or eat certain foods and that stimulates it. And they may not have it again until they eat or drink those certain foods. So, um, but if they have to go, they have to go. And if you, you know, like as a teacher, I have students who have this and when we just have a signal and they just roll out because that's embarrassing for them as well. Um, so, irritable bowel syndrome. Defecation is pooping. And in order to poop, it takes the parasympathetic signals, so you have to be relaxed, but then this is also completely voluntary. So you have to actually tell yourself to poop. You have to release that external anal sphincter, that skeletal muscle, so that that feces can move its way out. Here's a good picture of all that happening together with the sensory nervous system in blue, motor nervous system in red. It mentions here that your defecation is aided by Valsalva's maneuver. And we discussed Valsalva's maneuver in the respiratory chapter. Valsalva's maneuver is where you kind of hold your breath and you um, increase abdominal pressure. So that, oops, sorry. That allows for you to push the feces out of your body. So it talks about that. The closing of the glottis, traction of the diaphragm, increasing abdominal pressure. And it, then you will defecate. All right, this is the section that I thought to myself, if I had a choice to break things down and make it shorter, I would. So what this is gonna say is for each of the four biomolecules, we have four biomolecules, carbohydrates, proteins, let me say it in order, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. What this is gonna do is cover each one and talk about where it's digested and where, and, and, uh, or how it's digested and where it's absorbed. We already know where it's absorbed. Where is it absorbed? Small intestine. Fantastic. Okay. So, monosaccharides, we're dealing with carbohydrates. Carbohydrates, they started their digestion in the mouth with salivary amylase. Okay. Then it was increased. Their digestion continued with pancreatic amylase. And where'd that come from? The pancreas. So that's what it's mentioning there. It started in the mouth and it continued in the small intestine. And where it finally was absorbed small intestine. So here on these diagrams, and I'm pretty positive I did all of these on them, but it shows you where the digestion occurred and where absorption occurred. So mouth, small intestine, and it was of course absorbed in the small intestine. Is that confusing that I did it like that? No? Yes? Okay, for proteins. In order to digest a protein, we have to denature it. There's two things that can denature a protein, temperature and pH. In the digestive system, we're going to use pH. We're going to add acids to that. Where does protein digestion start? In the stomach. It will continue in the small intestine when we talk about pancreatic proteases. So these are enzymes that are released from the pancreas that break down protein. Pancreatic proteases. And then they're going to be absorbed in the small intestine. So this is showing you how they're coming through the small intestine for absorptive purposes. And you can read the steps, but ultimately all that's happening is the proteins are being broken down into amino acids, and the amino acids are being absorbed into the blood. So here the digestion is in the stomach and the small intestine. The absorption is in the small intestine for proteins. Here we have lipids. <clears throat> Whenever we talk about lipids, there's... Um, Hmm. There, it, it mentions lingual lipase, but there's no real digestion that occurs in the mouth. And there's pancreatic lipases, and then bile. And then absorption will occur in the small intestines as well. So here, I had mentioned that, remember, in fats, we can't really say they're digested. They just get into smaller fatness. So we have our fat globule, and then we use bile to emulsify it. We want to make them smaller so that they can be brought in through the lacteal. Okay, proteins, carbohydrates, and nucleic acids are absorbed directly into the blood. Fats are not. They go into the lymphatic system first, and then they go to the blood. Okay, so that's the only one that's different. So for lipids, we have mouth, stomach, small intestine for digestion, 
and small intestine for absorption. That's still showing digestion, that's not even showing absorption yet. But of course they're going to be absorbed in the small intestine. So mouth, stomach, and then small intestine, specifically the liver for bile and pancreatic lipases from the small intestine. Nucleic acids. Do you recall what nucleic acids are going to make? What are nucleic acids? This is throwback, I know. I'm really pulling on you right now. Deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA, and RNA. So how did DNA and RNA get in your food? <laughs> no, go ahead. I say the wrong thing all the time. How did DNA and RNA get in your food? You're eating things that are alive, or that were once alive. Hopefully you're not eating something that is alive. Okay, yeah. okay. but if you're eating something that was once alive, it has genetic material. And so by consuming it, even if you cook it before, by consuming it, you're still going to take in its genetic material. Now, is it going to turn into your genetic material? Not directly. You're going to take its genetic material, break it down into the A's, T's, C's, and G's, which is what we talked about a long time ago. But you're going to use those ATCs and Gs to create your own genetic material as you start to use it. So when it's talking about the digestion of nucleic acids, we're using pancreatic juices to break them down, pancreatic enzymes, and then they're going to be absorbed into the small intestine. So the digestion of nucleic acids and the absorption of nucleic acids occur in the small intestine. Absorption. All the absorption occurs in small intestine. Okay, and um, so pretty much, I mean, I already mentioned that. Water and nutrients are in small intestine. The only type of absorption that occurs outside of that would be in the large intestine, and that's mostly going to be water. The only reason you're going to absorb more water is because the longer that feces is sitting there. You may also get some vitamins, okay, if that bacteria is breaking down stuff for you. Everything goes into the blood except for lipids. Carbohydrates, proteins, and nucleic acids go into the blood. Lipids go into the lacteals or the lymphatic system first. Can you absorb whole proteins? The answer is no. And whenever we absorb whole proteins, then that can cause issues. Um, we, we do have the ability if necessary, but we, it can cause issues. When we talk about newborns, the, the issue we have with newborns is that their digestive system is not even nearly as advanced as it needs to be. And if we're giving them formula, and now it's not so big of a problem because there's not just one formula anymore. And there's not just four formulas anymore. If you've had a kid in the last two or three years, there's sometimes 30 different choices in formulas. And now we have soy-based. There's all these different. But the goal is finding the one that has the most broken down protein. The more proteins that are broken down, the more expensive it is. So the cheaper formulas you get, you think I'm kidding. I know, because I started looking at it, and I was like, okay. The cheaper formulas have whole proteins. So a lot of times we talk about babies having um, reflux. They'll throw up a whole lot because it hurts their stomach having these whole proteins. So the doctor, when you take them to the doctor, you're like, they, won't throw, they keep throwing up, they keep throwing up. Let's change the formula. That pretty much translates into you need to give them a formula that's more broken down. That baby can handle it. When you breastfeed a baby, those proteins are completely broken down because you've broken them down for that baby. So that's why it's, it, and it, it takes absolutely no time for them to digest breast milk because it's already broken down. Is that why it takes them longer to poop? Well, they'll, and their poop is yellow as opposed to being a brown fe fecal color because it's already digested and there's not a lot of work that they had to do to get the nutrients from it. A lot of times breastfed babies will eat more often than formula fed babies. Um, absorption of water, we already talked about, it happens a lot, mostly in the small intestine, but we can have some water reabsorbed or reclaimed in the large intestine. And when doing that, it may take also some minerals and some vitamins with it. Malabsorption of nutrients, anything that can interfere with the way that your pancreas functions may make it more difficult for you to absorb nutrients. And, of course, damage. But let me give you an example. Like, you shouldn't take your vitamins with orange juice. 
because orange juice will impede the absorption. When you take your vitamins, you need to take them with water. Anything that could impede absorption you would, would cause an issue with um, malabsorption or malnutrition. Okay, so uh, you need to make sure you have B12. You need to make sure that you're smart when you take your supplements, if you are taking your supplements and you're not overdoing certain supplements. But anything that would interfere with um, the pancreas, the pancreatic juices, emulsification, that will all cause you to not absorb things correctly. Also, if your mucosal lining is damaged, then of course you can't absorb. So that's going to be an issue. You're going to be malnourished because of that. And gluten diets or celiac, uh, celiac disease is caused by an intolerance to gluten. Some of these are legit gluten disorders, or but I think a lot of our society now is just thought that if you are gluten intolerant, that maybe you would lose weight if you changed your diet and just ate corn and rice based um, foods. That's fine. But gluten intolerance, celiac disease is caused by gluten intolerance. So you have an allergy to gluten. So how do you fix that? You just don't eat gluten. Um, and some, and I, like I said, I do believe people do have issues, but I think our society has a self-diagnostic problem. Developmental aspects. Your oral membrane is going to become your mouth. Your cloacal membrane is going to be your anus. We call it a cloaca in every other species except for us. By the fifth week, we actually have a canal, our alimentary canal. Is it as nearly as advanced? No. But we start to see our accessory organs budding afterwards. So look, you have your mouth to anus starting to form. And then look at your little accessory organs, little pancreas there, starting to grow. Okay. All right. Um, cleft palate would be just where these two bones here don't fuse. And we looked at that in a previous chapter. Tracheoesophageal fistula. Trachea, esophageal. Where am I at? I'm right here. Trachea and esophagus. All those, both those together. There's an opening between those two. Why is that an issue? The trachea takes in, and what does the esophagus take in? The trachea takes in air. Esophagus takes in food. And if there's a hole between them. What's in one can go to the other, and that can cause problems. These are things that happen developmentally, okay? So we try to fix them afterwards. Cystic fibrosis, this is not a necessarily a developmental disease. This is a genetic disease, and you can't fix that. You can treat it once it, that child is born. Whenever the child is in utero, it is nourished through the mom. So whatever the mom eats, the baby gets. When a, um, as far as anything taken into its alimentary canal in utero, it's only amniotic fluid. So in... Um, that's it. And the amniotic fluid towards the end of a uh, pregnancy is mostly just urine. The baby's urine, and but they don't. It's not going to hurt them because it's all within them. The newborn's rooting reflex is something natural for a full-term baby. If they're not full-term, then we we see that uh, they're not doing that, and we have to stimulate them to want to nurse. By the time that they're six months old, their newborn weight should have doubled, and they should be on an adult adult diet by the time they're two. Ulcers, cholecystis, cholecystitis, those are ulcers. They become problems as you get older, hopefully not younger. During old age, we see that the GI tract becomes less effective and less efficient, and that's usually because your eating patterns change. You start to poop less frequently. Your taste and smell is less acute. Periodontal disease starts to develop because you stop brushing your teeth. We see diverticulosis, fecal incontinence, which is the inability to hold your feces in and cancer of the gastrointestinal tract. Make sure you're eating healthy your whole life. Um, cancers, even though, um, well, colon cancer is actually becoming more and more prevalent, I'm sure. I don't know if you've heard of people getting it, but I feel like I, at least every two or three months, I'm hearing about somebody getting colon cancer. We don't need our colon, right? But if we're eating a diet high in fiber and we're taking care of ourselves throughout life, the likelihood that this occurs is less. Okay, we release or reduce those um, risk factors. So stomach and colon cancers are rare, but they do have high or early uh, symptoms that you can kind of say, hey, I'm, I'm kind of feeling this, like I have blood in my feces, or it hurts when I defecate, but it does metastasize easily. What does metastasize mean? Spreads. So they're rare, but they do spread. That becomes an issue. How do you prevent that? Take care of yourself. All right. 
pull stuff into that. 